most kids, when they're young, hate going to the dentist and also get really, really nervous before getting their shots at the doctor's office. But for me, one of the most anxiety-inducing experiences that I absolutely dreaded was going to the supermarket. And that's because I grew up in what is commonly referred to as a food desert. Now, these are neighborhoods where residents lack convenient access to affordable and healthy food options. You see, the closest full-service supermarket from my home in Ozone Park, Queens, was a 24-minute walk away into another zip code. During this walk, I'd pass McDonald's, a couple of gas stations, several liquor stores, and of course, a bunch of New York famous delis. My mom didn't drive, and there wasn't a bus that could make our trip more convenient. So almost every week and a half, my mom and I would set out on our journey to go get the groceries for our family of seven. When you're on a budget and you have that many mouths to feed, the options of how much fresh produce, how much healthy, nutrient-dense foods you'll be taking home with you becomes limited. Suddenly, it can become so tempting to stop inside one of those fast food restaurants or convenience stores on the way home to stock up on food for the week as a more affordable option. But we all know that can have serious potential health consequences in the future. But this is the unfortunate reality for the 51 million Americans currently living in these low access communities, majority of which are low income and minorities. Black and Hispanic Americans are currently carrying the burden of this problem. Because we see that these deserts, in contrast to what the name suggests, are not naturally occurring. Instead, food justice advocates prefer the term food apartheid in order to emphasize that these communities are directly resulted from systemic, discriminatory, and racist policies that grouped low-income communities of color together and eventually led to their limited access of healthy food. Eventually led to families like mine having to decide between an option that requires spending more money on getting to and purchasing healthier food options, or choose an option that is more affordable and convenient, but also life-threatening in the long run. But for a moment, let's think back to my community in Queens. Like I said, the closest 24-hour full-service supermarket was about 20 minute plus walk away from me. But in your head, can you guess what's less than about two minutes away? If you guess a deli or a bodega, they're the same thing really. You're right. This deli has been at the corner of my block for as long as I can remember. The owner Mike has known me since I was a little girl. And to this day, he's still the first familiar face I see when I travel back home, because I'll stop in there and he'll always welcome me back to Queens with a smile. A common phrase we often say in our home was that we pay Mike's bills, because of how often we stop and shop inside there. And I bet if you asked anyone else in our neighborhood, they'd probably say the same thing. But as much appreciation I have for the owners, I can't help but notice what's lacking on the shelves of this deli. Let us all take a look at what is and isn't stocked here. These are actual pictures taken on November 10th, 2022. Notice all the processed and junk foods, all of the frozen microwavable meals and the soda. Let us all now take an even closer look at their fresh produce section. A couple of bananas and a few avocados. Kind of sad, kind of really sad when you remember that delis just like this one are scattered all over neighborhoods like mine throughout Queens and are so much more accessible than say a farmer's market. But you know, it really wasn't even until I left home and had the opportunity to educate myself on what food apartheid looks like and it especially wasn't until I was sent back home during the COVID-19 pandemic when absolutely no one was making that walk to the supermarket that I realized my neighborhood, my built environment and the resources in it are actively working against my health 
and contributing to my future risk of experiencing adverse health outcomes. Because unfortunately, it didn't just stop at access to healthy and nutritious foods. For example, the closest gym from my home is about two miles away. And if you can't drive and have to walk there, like me, it's going to take you about 32 minutes and you'll have to cross a highway. My pediatrician's office that doesn't accept Medicaid, that accepts Medicaid, is about eight miles away from me. Two buses, one subway. The number one ranked New York Public High School is about six miles away from me. But this one's a little special because I actually went to this high school. It's called Townsend Harris, located all the way in Flushing. Every morning, I would wake up and commute for about an hour and a half and get on two different buses. Now, this school has an overall scorecard of 99.89, again, ranks number one in New York high schools, with an overall graduation rate of 100%. And I'm fully aware that going here, making that commute every morning and night was a key factor that brought me here to Boston University. Now, I'm a couple minutes away from multiple supermarkets, 10 minutes away from two different gyms, and have the ability to see a healthcare provider that is close and whenever I want. But what if instead I had gone to the high school in my neighborhood that was only five minutes away? I also have here the ranking for this school. It is ranked 297 in New York high schools with an overall scorecard of 81.21. Now this high school is actually just a singular floor on top of an already established middle school. The high school is severely underfunded and lacks the appropriate resources that the kids in my neighborhood deserve. And I was lucky enough to go to the high school that I did. But without luck, most don't even get that option. These are all examples of the social determinants of health. These are factors apart from medical care that strongly influence individual and group health statuses. So where people live, go to school, work, get their groceries from, etc. I'd like you all for a moment to think about your hometown and the place you grew up in and consider, what is the state of health there? Are people generally healthy? Can you look out your window and count the amount of people going for a run, going for a walk? It might not have mattered to you all back then, but when we consider the behaviors that influence health outcomes, like diabetes from poor diets or sedentary lifestyles, or lung disease due to smoking. We see that, yes, the individual, one's age, genetic makeup, sex, has the power to influence health outcomes, as well as that individual's choices and actions. Their behaviors when it comes to things like diet, physical activity, and smoking have the power to influence as well. It's still a choice to want to be healthy, want to be fit, want to be educated but factors outside of the individual exist and influence as well. Sometimes the choice, the options are not even there. Think about it like this. If you are forced into a desert, no matter how bad you want water, you can't control where the oasis are. In a neighborhood like mine, where you don't see those people on runs, those people in shape, who are knowledgeable about what a healthy diet looks like and are free of illness, it becomes so much more difficult to even become aware of the preventative behaviors that can shape the course of your life. So if we want to improve health, it's not just about creating new treatments and developing new medications, but it's about addressing these unfair social constraints and accessibility issues. There is no reason that my neighbors should have to put their physical, economic, mental, and social well-beings at risk simply because they do not have access to the resources and opportunities that are abundant in other zip codes. Financing for healthy food retailers to move into low-income communities, communities of color that lack nutritional and affordable food, is the first step in the right direction. Interventions can even look like providing transportation vouchers or getting more supermarkets and farmers markets to accept federal nutritional assistance in the form of the EBT payment option. Let's then take those healthy foods and prepare a nutritional meal for students to take their school 
or better yet, let's serve it to them in our public schools. Because with healthy, able bodies, we can push for these disparities to be acknowledged. We can stop allowing others to pull the focus from the underlying root causes that causes the disparities we face. By coining terms like food desert, which, has, which are misleading and inaccurate. It is apartheid, and it is not enabling everyone, despite what Zipkur they're born into, to reach their full potential. People in these communities are so worried about financial insecurity, transportation, and overall health issues that they are saddled with such life-threatening concerns that other people don't even have to think about. Raising their quality of living would allow these people more time to pursue passions, feed their curiosity, and dedicate their time to the things they want to do over the things they need to do to survive. So I thank you all for letting me share with you some of my personal experiences and taking the time to listen about the unique barriers that still plague families like mine. Because your neighborhood shouldn't make little girls want to fake being sick to avoid a supermarket trip or have teens having to spend three hours traveling to and from school. Your neighborhood should be a healthy place, not just to live in, but to thrive. Thank you.